will um, like to introduce everyone that's here to Anna Moore, um, who's a clinical lecturer of child psychiatry and clinical lead for the NIHR Children and Young People's Bioresource and a fellow at the Department of Engineering at the University of Cambridge. Um, she is going to be talking about the work she has been doing to create a regional linked data resource, including information about health, education, social environment and biological factors, such as genetic information, um, and using this database to create tools to sort of improve um, children and young people's mental health. And I'm sure she can do a much better job of explaining all the hard work she's been doing in this area. So I'll pass on to you, Anna. Thanks, Samia. Um, right, so I'm going to share my screen before we start. Um, do that. And then I shall also go full screen and my fingers crossed. Is that working for everyone? So I am um, yes, going to be talking about a piece of work that we've been doing probably for three or four years now. Um, so when I came to Cambridge, one of the things we did lots of chatting to people about what would be valued by the system and one of the things that kept coming up was saying actually you know we've got so many set data sets that we're not using so rather than creating another research database or collecting more data it'd be really great if we could use the data that we've got already and that tuned in fit really well with where I'd come from in UCL where we were doing a, um, <clears throat> a big evaluation of a new model of care for children's health services called iThrive which was very integrated um, health system and when we looked to evaluate it we only had access to health data and one of the, the big kind of um, impacts we were hoping to have with that clinical research, pro uh, with that um, new model of care was to impact on local authorities and education and schools. And we just had no way of evaluating the impact we were having. Um, so when I came to Cambridge, actually, it really fit in well with um, those research aims to say, actually, we need to have access to this multi-agency data for many reasons. Um, so I spent the last three or four years trying to put some of that in place, which is what I'm going to talk a bit about today. So we've had funding over that time from lots of different places. So um, Alan Turing, Dare UK, HDR UK, Anna Freud Centre, MRC actually as well. And we've had some money from the BRC. And really, so why are we doing this? It's we're aiming to fundamentally transform mental health outcomes for young people regionally, but also nationally. So we know that globally, four of the top 10 medical disabilities are psychiatric. And as you can see here, the prevalence of mental health disorders is continuing to rise. I mean, this is just 2017 data, and we know that during COVID and since it's got, it got even more um, significant in terms of burden to society. But we also know that the most vulnerable in society suffer the most and they're least able to access help. And if we're thinking about, OK, how are we going to try and solve some of these problems? Well, actually, um, the problems start in the first two decades of life, and those problems don't only d determine our mental health outcomes, but they also determine our physical health, our education, employment, and social and financial outcomes um, for those individuals in involved, their families, but also society. So we've got a huge opportunity to um, have impact if we can tackle some of this. And so then we think a little bit about what is causing those and the kind of etiology of that disease. So we know that the evidence describing the mechanisms is rapidly evolving and it's really being the role of, for example, epigenetics, genetics, immunology, inflammation, gut health and imaging, much more than it was in my training 20 years ago when I started. Um, and we really need to understand how these um, biological factors interact with our early life experiences and also with the environment that we grow up in. And we need to understand that across diverse populations. And so in order to do this, we hypothesize that actually we need these large representative data sets, which include data from lots of different domains that reflect, reflect the range of biopsychosocial factors that we need to help us study um, all of those um, interactions and help us understand how we become resilient and susceptible to disease. And we need to then translate that information into tools that can um, help us with early identification and personalized med medicine. But it really importantly, and this is critical to all of this research project we've been developing, is it must be embedded within a system that can support the rapid translation of that research into an integrated system for child health support. So we're actually impacting on children's lives and their families' lives and not sitting in our ivory towers, kind of just doing research that may one day help someone, someone. So in order to address that, we are building this data platform and we're aiming to bring together this longitudinal multi-domain data that spans health, education, social care. And we want to incorporate genomics and other biomarker data and potentially in the future imaging as well. 
And so that um, platform that we're proposing is going to have huge strategic implications for predicting and preventing child mental health problems. But actually, in fact, importantly, it's going to be embedded within the new um, children's hospital that's being built. And that is going to provide us with a unique opportunity to really rapidly translate this data that we're collating into clinical products with novel clinical pathway for early identification and intervention. Um, so the key thing to say is that this is only possible with a really um, diverse multidisciplinary partnership, which I hope that this talk today will um, illustrate um, how many domains that we're, we're having to work across and the partners that we're working with. So <clears throat> in order to create the foundation, so the first question for this is really to answer, you know, what is the data that needs to go into these um, tools, what data we need access to. So in order to do this, we've done a piece of work which has been led by Catherine, who's on this talk and um, as part of her PhD. And we started off by doing a Delphi study because when we looked at the literature, there was no definitive um, set, um, set of information that helped us to understand what would be the um, most likely and useful predictors of child mental health. Lots, so we started off by doing um, a quite a pre pretty quick and dirty um, umbrella review. So kind of a review of reviews and get a set, got a set of candidate factors of about 200. And then we put those through a Delphi study. So a Delphi study is a three stage in our case um, um, set of kind of um, questionnaires which are done with experts where we ask them to um, give us feedback on um, uh, this, this framework that we've created in order to refine it and help us make it um, the most suitable based on this broad range of expertise. So what we're aiming to do is create a, a, um, a theoretical framework that helped us to understand what the risk factors were that would be most important for predicting mental health problems in children and young people. And as I say, we took this through three rounds, um, this candidate set of factors we had. Um, we asked 48 experts who were um, really broad ranging. So clinicians, educators, academics, people who worked in child trauma, um, social workers, and it was a range of clinicians and academics. And um, when we looked at their average experience, it was just under 20 years. So there were people who knew what they were talking about and had a broad range of input. And from this, we created this theoretical um, framework, which has 287 risk factors, um, identified these seven domains. And then we've got an eighth domain here, which is um, draws from these seven domains. And it brings together all of the um, factors that are particularly relevant for underserved populations. So one of the things that we did, because we really feel that when we're thinking about um, building these things that co-creation is important, but it needs to be representative co-creation. We did a lot of work um, to try and ensure that our experts who are supporting us um, were um, diverse in terms of their own characteristics, but also in terms of the work and the young people that they worked with. So from this, we now have this um, framework of factors split up into different domains that we can use. Um, and then from this, we're creating a data dictionary um, um, that enables us to measure these 287 risk factors across routinely collected databases. And that's providing us with this suite of factors that we can quite quickly and rapidly um, plug into um, prediction tools. So here we've got a terrible slide um, because it's a small type, but it just gives you a taste of some of the types of factors that um, we identified. So one of the bits of feedback we re really frequently have on this is, oh, they're all different levels. So, you know, sometimes you've got people, things which are incredibly specific, like um, being victim of an earthquake and other things which are very, very high level, which are um, um, having experience living in, a, in, a, in an area where there's um, racial abuse. And the thing we say is that actually that's because this was born on literature review initially. So some of the papers we looked at were very specific and some of them very broad ranging. And so we pulled out all of the factors which had um, were from good quality or better um, papers, which um, and showed a significant impact on positive impact or increased risk of acquiring a mental health problem later. And it didn't have to be definitive. It just had to have reasonably robust epidemi epidemiological link between having a risk, that risk factor and acquiring a mental health problem later. And then obviously taking it through the Delphi, there was lots of refinement of those risk factors. Um, the, one of the things that the Delphi um, did help us think about is that whether the level at which um, risk factors impacted on a young person. So um, as a result of that, we've got this um, split of each of the domains into risk factors that affect the individual, that affect the family or the care unit that a young person grows up in, 
and those that affect the society that that young person lives in. Um, so um, that was, we thought, a really helpful um, addition to the, to the framework. So the next challenge is, okay, that's all very nice, but how do we build these into clinically useful tools? <clears throat> so if we look a little bit at the literature that there exists already, actually this has been done a lot and there's a huge amount of work already on building AI models for, um, uh, for um, mental health. So for example, there's even systematic reviews of how we diagnose mental illness. Now. We're, not at, we're at that level, kind of level of um, evidence now. Um, we're also are able to predict um, whether people can, how they respond to treatment. We also are using a broad range of data now, so not just clinical data, but for example, social media data can really help us to diagnose and characterize individuals. Um, and then there's increasing um, research now into use of health record data. But the key sticking point now for all of these models is our inability to create an AI model that is accurate enough for clinical application. So we have this kind of dual edged challenge. So on one hand, we can build very accurate models which meet all the requirements for accuracy, but the data that we use to do that is very specifically created, curated health um, research data. So for example, collected by psychologists and experimental um, environment. And then we can create, create very accurate models. If on the other hand, we look at just the electronic health record data, which for the most part is not linked, so it might just be mental health data or just GP data or just acute data, actually the accuracy of the models is pretty terrible. Um, and so they're not implementable. And then when we try and validate a model that's developed in a research setting, it's almost impossible to, to utilize that in a clinical research real life setting because we just don't collect the same data or the data is not available. So how are we going to address that? Well, we are doing this by um, applying this multi-domain um, risk factor set that we've created to our routinely collected data. And um, our first piece of research, which Catherine, so Catherine's been needing for the last couple of years, is to say, if we look at a similar data set that already exists, because bear in mind we're building ours and it doesn't exist yet, is it possible, just can we, from a, hypothetically, how many of these risk factors that we think are important to prediction could we get from these data sets? So we use something called SAIL, which is the Welsh data bank, so adolescent data platform, and that involves all the children across Wales. And there's 17 relevant data sets that we've got access to that we've linked over which took about six months. And we've now got access to data relating to about 1.1 million children. And that data includes um, health, education, social care data. When we talk about health, it's everything from primary care to 111 to um, outpatient, inpatient, all, all the health data you can imagine, and then a range of demographic data as well. And so as the Royal We, Catherine, spent many months mapping these 287 risk factors to those 17 data sets um, to see actually to what extent have we got good coverage. And actually we found it's not bad. So about, you know, just over a third of the risk factors we could measure and um, within the data sets without too much effort. So um, if you look in the table here, you can see the kinds of databases, the kinds of measurables, uh, measures we could access. So for demographics, we've got all things like urbanicity, as in how urban was the, your uh, region that you live in, um, birth weight and employment, deprivation, um, gender, month of birth, Education, we had, again, um, a validation data set, so ethnicity information was in there as well, but we could also derive things like deprivation um, by looking at participation in free lunch programme, educational attainment, um, lots of marks for disability, um, for example, SEN, some special education need information um, and information, and then also kind of behavioural proxies like um, to what extent you've been excluded. Social care, lots of information on adverse um, childhood experiences. Uh, and then primary care and acute care, we could get lots of information about comorbidities. Um, and then for all of these, we're able to um, collect information because it's longitudinal data on the patterns of service use. So has someone got a lot of social care input or a lot of um, exclusions or um, either very high um, health care contact or very low health care contact? So that was really heartening because it made give us a lot of confidence that actually what we're doing is valid and the likelihood is we will be able to build tools. So we have done some preliminary, which I'm not going to present today, but model building within that data set. And, um, and you know, we're able to build models 
just for social care data, using that linked data with um, area under the curve, just with those variables of, you know, around, I think, 0 0.885, um, so it's looking promising. So in terms of what we're doing um, to create a resource that can be used locally, we're creating something called Cadre. So this used to be called CamChild, but we've gone through a rebranding exercise um, and it's now called Cadre. Um, and that's a child and adolescent data resource. And a lot of the thinking behind that was as, as we fed federate, Cam Child's kind of okay, and, and Birmingham Child's kind of okay, and Essex Child, but when we got to Manchester and we were shortening it to Man Child, we felt that that was perhaps not, <laughs> it was, didn't have the greatest utility. And also, the, anyway, so we've, we've called it Cadre now. And Cadre is um, this data resource, um, which brings together longitudinal, multi-domain data which is going to span health education social care so very similar to the um, sale data bank but also we're going to be able to include the biomarker data through our collaboration with the nihr bio resource which is collecting um, the genomic and deep phenotyping and um, data relating to children and then also we're talking to brc members to think about how we might be able to incorporate imaging data um, so we worked a long time um, with our local regional partners on this. Um, so we're working closely with that CUH, CPFT, CCS, local authorities, local schools, as well as the bioresource. And our resource here is going to include data relating to all children between 0 and 17 within our region. Um, and, um, and it's going to be available in a de-identified format um, to researchers subject to local ethical agreements. So we're going to talk a bit about that and the governance in a bit we have time um, and the idea of this data set is it's going to have lots of broad ranging uses so it can be used for research innovation how we are but actually um, local authority local regions so whether it's an ICS or an individual trust can use it for QI and then actually for example ICSs can use it so integrated care systems can use it for commissioning and population health so we're going to talk a little bit about the PPI that's been re required over the last two years to do this which is patient and public involvement work and engagement we can talk about the technologies, what I'm going to talk about next, and then the governance pain that we've gone through to get this agreed. Um, OK. So we're going to go on to the tech and the infrastructure. So over the last, oh, not that quickly though, over the last um, year and a half, we've been working with tech partners um, to build a trusted research environment, or I think it might, they might be called shared data environments in the future, but at the moment it's a TRE. Um, and this is just the architecture for what we've built, and we've actually built this already. Um, so this data is de-identified at source. So you can see here we've got local data um, controllers, and these are all the partners who are contributing to um, the database. And that data is de-identified at source using Crate, which was developed by Rudolf Cardinal. And that data is then transferred to, to, will be transferred to our trusted research environment, which is hosted in AIMS, which is currently used by Bioresource and lots of other organisations to host their um, data requirements. And it has all the NHS approvals required. And um, within the TRE, we're going, we have integrated two pieces of software. So one is called Intermine, which was actually developed in the Department of Psychiatry, Department of Genetics by Goss Micklem et al. And um, that is a piece of software that has been um, designed specifically to rapidly integrate heterogeneous data sets, which is obviously the challenge we're facing. And then we've also integrated something called Bitfount, which is a local startup um, in Cambridge, and they have expertise and specialise in privacy preserving federated analytics. And I'll, I'll explain why that's useful in the future. So what happens is that our data gets transferred into, into AIMS and into an Intermine database where we link it and then um, people will be able to have um, apply for access to the data to a data access committee who will go through various checks and balances to make sure it's um, something we approve of that's acceptable and that the use is appropriate and that the people asking for it have got all the relevant um, kind of requirement you know like um they meet the requirements in terms of their own individual you know i can't even think of the word qualifications and things and then also the project this is one that we all agree there's a good project to do 
and then at that point they'll be given an access um, key and they'll be able to access their data on the trust research environment via the virtual desktop environment which has got two-factor authentication um, and users role-based access approach so at that point they'll be able to do their data within the trusted environment a bit like sale experience if anyone's used sale and then they will never be able to download patient level data they will only they'll be able to see patient level data on their screens they won't be able to save it or download it they'll be able to do their analysis within python or r are two options at the moment and then be able to um, send that um, to um, for verification by the database managers and then when we can demonstrate that the results are suitably um, aggregated then that will be released back to individuals so individuals are only ever be able to get fully de-identified aggregated data um, so the good the, the the value of you taking this approach is that we're able to standardize the data using intermine um, and that we're also able to because it was developed in the department of genetics for genetic data initially and we've adapted it for use for healthcare records then we have got the capacity to integrate the genetic and the biomarker data when we incorporate that and we'll talk a little bit about the federated analytics in a minute so one of the um, critical things for model building is the need to have these large representative data sets so there's a range of different reasons why we need that and why having just a data set in Cambridge isn't quite good enough so first thing we need to be able to externally validate models that we build um, in similar data sets so we need to be able to ensure that the data that we're building models in is representative so for example if we were just build models in Cambridge it's well known to be not a representative of the general population in England so it's likely that we'd be introducing bias if we try to apply those for example in Birmingham and we also need to have a large sample size if we're going to predict rare events so um, childhood suicide is thankfully rare if I was to try and predict that in England in Cambridgeshire even over the last 10 years the number of cases would be small and so therefore the likelihood of me being able to do that accurately or effectively is, is, is small however if I'm able to um, create a larger data set or have access to a larger area then it's much more likely that I'll be able to build a model that can predict rare events so in order to address this we have as I said worked with um, Bitfount to create a privacy preserving federated infrastructure and this means that um, we will be creating a cadre in Cambridge and we're also collaborating with Birmingham and Essex to create similar databases there. And then also we've now got agreement to, to federate with, with SAIL as well. And so what we will be able to do when we um, complete the federation is to be able to do privacy preserving analytics across these four sites. And that will provide us access to almost two million children. So privacy preserving federated analytics means that if I am looking within the Cambridge TRE or within the Birmingham TRE, and I have permission to look at data within those, I can look at my patient level data, but I can never pull the data between Cambridge and Birmingham to look at patient level data. I can sit in the middle here and I can look at, um, I can log into my Bitfound pod and based on my understanding of these data sets individually, I can write code and build models and send that to these cadres, uh, to both of these cadre databases. And then Bitfount, through its privacy preserving analytics, is able to um, do the analysis across both of these and then give me the, the aggregated results. So I can do my analysis across both of these databases without ever actually seeing the individual patient level data brought together in one place. I could log into Cardra Cambridge on my own uh, and look at the patient level data, or I could log into Birmingham on, and look at patient level data, but I can't ever group these. And that analytics can then happen across any of the four um group so you can look at any combination of, of those data sets including all of them um, <clears throat> so another issue that we're looking to address here is standardization so sadly Birmingham and Essex and Cambridge and Wales don't all measure the same thing in the same way so many points at which this falls down is that when people try and federate across different data sets like this they can write a code to say I would like to measure depression but actually if I use ICD-10 to measure depression in Birmingham and I've got a different def different way of measuring it in Cambridge and a different way of measuring it in Wales it's very it would be very time consuming to write that code and I'd have to it, it, and it also it'd be very laborious if every research group was trying to do the same thing every time they wanted to measure depression 
And then if you imagine those 287 risk factors, it's just like endless. And that's why we've, we're have we doing the work with Catherine and we'll take it forward part post her PhD is to create this unified dictionary. So we've got this dictionary of risk factors and we'll have a dictionary of outcomes. And part of our work as a central team will be able to, will be to create a data model, which, um, which we can automate within Intermine so that we will have a dictionary for, for example, a way of measuring childhood maltreatment or depression or um, any of the other 287 risk factors were identified, which means that we've, we, we can rapidly measure and rapidly translate or use this database to create um, different data products, which makes it appealing for researchers, but also potentially for industry partners going forward, as well as for local health partners. So for example, um, we've had a lot of interest when we talk to ICS is that the possibility of being able to measure adverse child experiences across various aspects of the country to see how they um, you know, compare in terms of how they're doing. So as I alluded to before, this work has um, really relied on a really diverse partnership. So um, we've had regional partners and we've worked closely with um, our local authority, um, acute community and mental health partners. Academic partners have been absolutely critical and continue to be, including Birmingham, Essex, Bioresource, ARC, Alan Turing, this institute. And then also industry and third sector. So without working alongside these organisations, we wouldn't have been able to, um, to do this work. So I'm going to talk briefly about the PPI work that's been done. So this is being led by Alyssa, who is our programme manager, postdoc programme manager. And it's been absolutely critical to um, enabling the governance to be delivered and also to be getting kind of also almost a mandate from the public to be able to do this. Again, diversity has been core to um, our values. And so to support this, we have um, created this network of 171 at the point the slide was making, but I think it's close to 200 now, people from across the country. Um, and we've had a real focus on um, recruiting people who are um, diverse, uh, who've got come from a broad range of backgrounds. And it's really important because, you know, the worst outcomes are suffered by people who are um, also least able to access support, but often have the least input into these projects. And also there's a very real potential for these data-driven solutions to exacerbate inequalities across the entire pipeline. Um, so we're working with the Anna Freud Centre um, to do this. And this group of people we used for um, our PPI work to help us design models to interpret, and they're also part of our management and strategic um, leadership team as well. So the work that we've done with them over the last year has to really been, um, so we've worked with people from across the whole country, not just Cambridge, uh, Cambridge, and we really needed to know what do people think about just creating these linked databases and multi-agency data. Um, should we be using this data for, what, you know, how should we be using it, and should is it okay to use it to identify people with mental health problems or not? Um, who should access the data when we create the TRE? Um, and also how do we best communicate and inform people about what's going on. So we did over last summer, we did four workshops with each of these four groups. So there was four workshops for this age group, four workshops for 16 to 24 year olds and four workshops for carers and parents, parents and carers. Um, and that, as I said, had quite a broad range of participation. And just the findings here is we were quite, I was quite anxious about this, if I'm honest, because I thought, you know, if this doesn't go well, I kind of like to go home and find another job, <laughs> focusing on this for the last few years. But actually, it was really encouraging. Um, and people were overwhelmingly enthusiastic about the project. Um, one of the things that was really striking is that people said we thought kind of thought it was happening already. And also, it is happening in acute health. Why on earth is mental health so far behind everyone else? It's a bit shocking this day and age. Um, and um, one of the other things is that they felt that um, decisions to, about access should be done, made by relevant experts and community representatives. And interestingly, the kids didn't want the parents to be involved in that decision. And, um, and actually, there's quite a lot of suspicion about academics and academics being involved in that decision making process, which we found interesting. Um, and also not wanting politicians um, and journalists to be involved in those decisions because they felt that, that was um, problematic. Um, 
there was lots of different ways that people should be communicated with and people felt that it shouldn't be just the leaflets and the GP surgeries but actually it should be um, via social media and websites and we should be making quite a um, targeted um, effort to reach underserved groups and obviously we needed to make it um, clear and easy to understand. I mean there's a, uh, um, a uh, quote there from young people what we wanted to do as well is once we um, had gone through the process over the summer, we wanted to kind of ratify, as it were, or we'll kind of validate our results by then doing a survey, with um, which we opened out to all of the people in the community practice and then via, via charities as well, in order to validate our results and just to get a sense of if we ask more than just the five people in those workshops, do we get that same kind of response? Um, and actually the majority of people felt that yes we should be linking the data they were very positive about it and they felt that the benefits outweighed the risks so this was all very reassuring and there was different categories that people i uh, which we addressed and people identified and um, one is that people were really clear that there was a real benefit to this um one of the key issues that came up time and time again is people saying that actually they felt that they'd lost a lot of their childhood because of the difficulty in accessing identifying mental health problems and they felt this would have a real opportunity to help stop people from falling through the gaps um, but there needed to be um, quite a lot of thought about who accessed the data um, and also when we were building models and tools we needed to have quite a lot of contextual information about um, the data and also we need to really understand how different data types might mean different things for different subgroups and different populations um, and so therefore that really highlighted this need for um, diverse groups and that actually we should be actively informing people about the fact we're doing this and we talked about how we could earn the public's trust around it um, and one of the things that really came through is about motivation so interestingly we were quite obviously when we're building this TRE we want to make it available for academics and the NHS to use but we're also interested to understand what the public thought about um, industry using data and accessing it and we expected people to say blank no to industry and commercial people but actually they that wasn't um, what we found what we found is people cared more about the motivations of the individual or the group or the organization was to access the data and whether they had the appropriate skill sets to be able to use it right appropriately and that was more important than whether they were making money or not for example um, people highlighted the fact that in children's mental health, a lot of care inpatient provision is via private sector now. So they were worried that the private sector wouldn't be able to have access to this data, um, which they should have because they need to improve their services as well. Also, there was concern about um, um, private schools and what have you not being able to access. So the distinction wasn't about whether people made money, it was about their motivation behind what they were doing and whether they had competence. So for example, they were more worried about startups using the data versus big pharmaceuticals because they thought the startups were rapidly trying to make money and didn't necessarily have the expertise in the track record whereas a big pharmaceutical company although they're making money had a good track record and lots of education and opportunities for staff so they felt more confident about that which we found was a really interesting nuance that I hadn't come across before and so to summary the public sports depends on trust diversity and transparency um, so we needed to build trust and that was about relationship, not just about communication. We needed to co-create in particular with underserved groups and we need to be very clear about um, what we were doing and recognise that there, the risks weren't zero, but how we were addressing them and what the benefits to society might be. So the next point is the information governance, which is perhaps more, more dry, although actually when we were going through the process, it wasn't dry at all. It was quite, quite emotionally charged at times. So <laughs> we will try and go through this briefly. But um, so the key with our IG model and the difference or the difficulty we have with this project is that we're not just creating an IG model for one local region. We then need to have a model that's acceptable for a, fed, a range of regions um, and um, that enables federation. So the approach we've taken is that we wanted to, we decided on was to have um, local IG models which um, could be used by a single organisation or region for each of the individual TREs um, and then we would have, um, sorry, 
sitting above that this kind of super overarching IG model which you can see here which which address federation and what that meant is it's extensible in terms of models so and what we were really keen for is for the, the over, overarching IG model here not to be dependent on what the local organizations tried to do and how they ran their 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 local IG so for example in the way we're approaching it Cambridge and Birmingham and Essex as examples can have their own locally agreed way of managing their TRE, which we will go into the details of those in, in a minute. And how they and, and how they run that is up to each local or local region. But then what we need to sit above it is that which each of these organizations contribute to is this data federation um, IG model, which works independently and isn't dependent on how these work, but enables us to make joint decisions about how the data is used for federation purposes separately. And that just that meant that we have that independence and also problems in Cambridge don't affect Essex or Birmingham or the federation um, issues, because we know that there's lots of variability regionally. So um, one of the things that we looked at is what are all the different IG requirements for this project? And I won't go through this again, but essentially just I won't go into these in any details, but these are, this is what you need to, we need to set up and arrange for. Sorry, I've got automatic flicking through. I don't know how to stop it on these slides. Um, is these are all the different um, agreements that we need to set up for each region. Um, and now as a result of this project, we have a framework for each of these. So we've got a, um, a blank template that can be used by any region um, for a data sharing model that includes health, education, social care, that sets out all of the legal case, um, it sets out all of the legal um, uh, justification which you need for the Health and Social Care Act and, um, and for the HRA um, as part of these documents which can now be used by any, any region um, and they're available, they're freely available for use. But one of the key things that needs to be decided on locally regardless of um, having those frameworks or not is actually what the model of your data sharing, the, the structure of your data sharing model is. So the legal team we work with, which is Information Governance, Governance Systems, IGS consultancy, were absolutely fantastic. So they initially set up the governance for Chris and then um, now run the um, HDR UK data hub, Discover Now. They helped us to do this and they came up with these two possible models, one which is a six joint control where all the people contributing equal joint controllers and the other was where you'd have two key um, controllers, so one was the, um, for example, a trust plus the university, and then all of the other organisations contributed um, to the decisions, but actually it was just controlled by those two organisations. And there was various um, benefits and um, disadvantages of each. So for this model, we'd have all six organisations acting as joint controllers, and they would all be responsible for making the strategic and operational decisions on the basis of majority voting. Um, so this gives a lot of benefits, including all of the organisations involved um, have um, contribute to the decisions about how it's used and how it's managed. Um, it's also consistent with the PPI feedback we had, which was around um, keeping research database in the hands of the NHS and other trusted organisations. And it also is a model um, which is lawful and it's been shown to be lawful through um, various other HDR projects. So from that perspective, we were confident it was a good one or a good possibility. But a real difficulty with this model was that actually it requires, and these are issues that are, you know, they're found all over the country. And if you look at all the literature consistently, this is the issue that comes up time and time and time again. So it's not specific to this region. But um, you need to have really close relationship, working relationships between the different agencies involved. And that isn't often, they, they, they have good relationships in, in, in lots of ways, but um, across the whole country, there's not necessarily always good working relationships between all the organizations. Um, also, we found that um, there was um, um, quite a lot of um, thinking about what the HRA's view was and not necessarily um, as much weight given to what the GDPR um, Data Protection Act says. And so, and then we found when we were looking at this, there was, we really struggled because there was limited um, guidance from the ICO to really kind of guide us as to which way to go for this model. Um, so it was, we did find it problematic. 
so the other alternative model, um, we had um, here we had two organisations um, that would be able to um, address take um, joint controllership of the data. And this also coincides with PPI feedback in that it's still got the NHS, which is in control of the data, and it's also a legally sound model. Um, so some of the difficulties were, is that there were, with this model, the, the problem is, is you have to, you almost have to have more strong relationships within a region, which actually we found we did have in Cambridge, which was really positive, in that you have to have the organisations who are not joint controllers being willing to um, let the other organisations have more direct control of their data. And um, we have found that actually a real positive of this project is that they were willing to do that. Um, the problem that we're worried about in the future, potentially with using this model, is that if we add in more joint controllers or more partners want to be contributing data, it might be that they don't agree to this model because they have to be willing to hand off the control of their data to these two organisations. And we don't know in the future whether that will be possible. So it was really good that we were able to come to that agreement with the current partners, but we don't know if we will be able to in the future. Um, so the good news is that we were able to agree a mo model, which was a second. So now we do have an agreement for um, a joint multi-agency data sharing agreement within our region in Cambridge. And that's for the first time that we've achieved that. And that's using the second model, which is really exciting um, that we can move forward with that. And then the next part is the federation. Um, so we're now working on that. Um, and um, the good news is that because of data federation IG model is independent for the of the models that are chosen locally, we're able to um, continue with that um, uh, regardless of what model other organisations choose to use. Um, so um, here we're going to have again two governing bodies, one will be for strategic um, level decisions and the other for operational level decisions and this will give each of the TREs a lot of autonomy and they'll be able to consider what um, they're able to approve or veto in terms of their use of their data on a case-by-case -case basis so we're really positive about that and actually all of the organizations including Essex and Birmingham um, see this as a really positive approach and way of doing it. So our conclusion is um, that it was um, that the main challenge is overcoming uh, these kind of really polarized views about the best way to use data, which again, as I say, is something we've consistently found across um, the region, uh, not the region, but in the data, in the literature relating to developing IG models. Um, we also feel that it's more helpful if we could have more clear guidance from the ICO. Um, and also um, there needs to be more thought about the relative um, value of the different data protection acts um, in terms of how to make decisions about data use. So thinking about um, how this system will be based within the children's hospital. So it's absolutely critical that the academic outputs that we are generating are able to serve people that they're designed for and we need to do that quickly. So if you look at the literature now, the average time for um, basic research to get into clinical practice is cited as being about 17 years which is crazy. So the way we've been designing this is to try and um, shorten that and to, to, to bridge it. Um, and so because of that, we've, de we've designed this system to be embedded within the new children's, um, uh, Cambridge Children's Hospital Research Institute, and it will be linked within their clinical systems. So we're going to be working with Microsoft, Illumina, um, and other um, partners, um, who many of whom are contributing actually to this pro bono, as well as academic partners, so the ARC and the This Institute, and we're going to be design, designing these early identification systems um, that will be embedded within this children's hospital. So we'll be able to trial them there first and then quickly, rapidly um, use them. Our core focus of our work is going to be to build those tools within, um, for use within the community, so by the use by local authorities, schools, community health and care systems. And that's really because we need to be thinking a lot about how our um tools are serving the community and they can't really it's not really as useful for them to be delivered 
um, solely within these large tertiary care centres. And really, we need to be able to prioritise enabling the care to be delivered in the community and supporting community partners to be able to identify and manage mental health ser services rather than expecting the, the centre to be able, all these big tertiary centres to be able to deal with it. And a result of that, we're doing a lot of work with the local authority and the integrated care systems to be able to think about how we would develop the um, prevention and the personalised early intervention systems and pathways that will support that. So in terms of our next steps, we need to operationalize the, the, the model. So we're going to be applying for our ethics based on our agreement for the, for the um, governance model this spring um, with the aim to be in a position to put real data in the TRE by summer. Um, and we're going to be doing a lot of thinking about the metadata and building the data model for child health using Intermind so that we can operationalize and rapidly use those risk factors. And that will be um, the other piece of work that we're doing this year. And then next from next year, we'll be looking to federate with non-AIMS TRE. So for example, um, SAIL uh, is going to be the first one that we're going to be exploring and possibly discover now as well. Um, and then also really thinking about what it means to have an innovation hub embedded within children's hospitals so that we can start translating some of these things into clinical practice and underpinning it all is going to be ongoing PPI work. So with the Anna Freud Centre, we're now um, working to um, formalise that PPI group and create a community of interest who are, are going to be working with us, but also willing to work with other research projects relating to child health um, over the coming years. And that's with the BRC support as well. So we're excited by that. And that's me done. So thank you very much for any questions. Happy to discuss.